Hello, good morning. This is Rick Pina, and I'm bringing you today's word. This is part of the Grace Life podcast, where I'm teaching you how to live by faith and tap into God's grace on a daily basis. And I'm bringing you this message for this morning. I pray that you're ready to receive. Listen, today what we're going to do is have somewhat of a faith refresher. From time to time, we need to be reminded what it means to walk and live by faith. God does everything that he does by grace. Grace is unearned. It is unmerited. It is undeserved. It is the the free favor of God, which is why I teach the grace life. Well, in response to God's grace, we have to do everything by faith. And that's what we're going to deal with today. All year long, I've been teaching a series entitled How to Live with a Laser Focus on God's Fixed Purpose. So we are locked in and focused. Say, I'm locked in. We're locked in and focused on becoming who it is that God has called us to be for this particular season. And then we're not going to be distracted. We're going to be locked in and watch this. We have a laser focus on it and we're going to stand in faith without a doubt, without wavering to see what God said come to pass. So to make that happen, we have to add patience to our faith. It is through faith and patience. Hebrews 6 and 12 says that we obtain the promises of God. The title of today's message, as we've been walking through the story of uh, Joseph, we're at a point in the story of Joseph where I'm going to highlight that there was there was some some fear, there was some doubt, and there was some unbelief in this whole story, and I'm going to highlight that. And so we're going to learn from that what not to do. The title of today's message comes in the form of a question. Here is the question. Can you take God at his word? Can you take God at his word? For me, the answer is yes. For you, if you listen to me long enough, the answer will be yes as well. We live by faith and we're going to stand on every word from God and we take God at his word. Put this in the chat. Say, I take God at his word. Let's get ready for the word. This is going to be good. so can you take God at his word? Living by faith means that I receive a word from God and I stand on that word. I do this live stream every day. And what you see here on YouTube is like the edited version, but there's a version that's the live stream where we actually pray. I get to pray for some of the people on the live stream before I kind of give you this edited version. And in this morning's live stream, one of the people, one of my brothers ask for prayer. And what he was saying is this, you know, he was diagnosed with something and he's going to the doctor. Now he believes that he's completely healed and he's going to the doctor and he wants the doctor to verify what he already knows in his heart, what God already said. And he's standing in faith that it's already done, that he's already healed, that he, his body is free of what was there before. And he's going now just to, to seek sense realm evidence so that the world can validate what God already said, but it's already established in his heart. That's how we live by faith. We walk and live by faith and not by sight. And I'm going to I'm gonna bring up some things in the story of the life of Joseph that we're going to learn from today. And this is going to be like a faith refresher, like I said. So the foundation of scripture we've been looking at all year is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25. This is what it says. Set your gaze on the path before you. With fixed purpose, looking straight ahead, ignore life's distractions. So God has set a path before me. Along that path, there's some great and precious promises. And I'm going to walk down that path, believing what God said will come to pass in the fullness of God's timing. And I will not be distracted. Say that. Say, I refuse to be distracted. Another scripture we've been meditating on, we've been looking at this every day for about two and a half months, is James chapter one, verses two through four. This is what it says. My fellow believers... When it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, instead of being upset, instead of throwing in the towel, instead of saying, woe is me, you could be like, whoa, it's me. God God has given me the grace. I got this. You should see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that you, when your faith is tested, I have an opportunity now. My faith is being tested. Am I going to allow the external to dictate my internal? 
Or do I see it as an invaluable opportunity to show God that, watch this, my internal state is not based on external conditions or circumstances. No, no, my internal state is not based on what a doctor said or a lawyer said or the world is saying or a financial statement. My internal state is based on what God said. Verse three says, for you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up inside of you the power to endure all things. Put in the chat, oh, I have the power to endure all things. Why? Because I'm consistently consistent on the inside. At the force of consistency, patience is at work in my life. And when this force, this endurance grows stronger and stronger and stronger, verse four says it releases perfection or maturity into every part of your being until there's nothing missing and nothing lacking. Say that. Say I'm grown up in Christ. And that means there's nothing missing and nothing lacking. God is on me and in me and with me and for me. And I'm not moved by what I see. I'm only moved by what God said. Say amen to that. Ecclesiastes chapter three and verse one says there's a right time for everything and everything on earth is going to happen when? At just the right time. And now let me set up the stage. I'm going to set the stage for the story today. I'm covering Genesis chapter 46 uh, from Genesis chapter 46 and verse 31 all the way to Genesis chapter 47 and verse six. That's what I'm covering today in today's message. So after Joseph, uh, Joseph's family got to Egypt, he sees the whole family and he noticed that they came from Canaan. He told them not to bring the animals and stuff, but they came with the animals. So he finally gets to see his father. He's now there with his father and the 11 brothers. So all 12 are reunited and they're all there. And he says, okay, now we got to get ready to go talk to the king. All right. I'm going to go talk to the king first and let them know that you have arrived from Canaan. Now, I'm going to tell him that you guys are shepherds and that you have brought sheep and goats and cattle and everything else that you own. Now, once again, this is noteworthy because when the king, Pharaoh, told the brothers, hey, go get your dad, he said to them, just go get your dad, go get your family, come back here and don't bring anything. You don't need to bring anything. I'm going to give you everything. Now, they went and told their dad that, but I don't know if it was the dad. I don't know if it was them, but obviously there was some unbelief because they was like, well, nah, we're not, we're bringing everything. So they brought everything. In other words, they didn't have full confidence in what the king was saying. So Jacob and Joseph's brothers did not really have confidence and faith is all about confidence. And so in other words, they didn't have faith in what the king said. Not only that, they didn't have faith in what Joseph said, because Joseph also told them, hey, we're going to give you the best land, just come, all of that stuff. So they believed, but they kind of really didn't believe. And that's how people do God all the time. So Joseph went on to say, okay, Joseph really wasn't believing. He said, okay, listen, come on, come here for a minute. What's up? The king is going to call you in and and he's going to ask you, listen, I, in, in this land, nobody has authority over me, but there's one man. So we got to make sure this one man is okay. All right. Y'all ready? Yeah. Here's the thing. Here's the plan. He's going to call you in and ask you what you do for a living. When he does, you need to say, we are shepherds and our family always raises sheep. Say that. Repeat it. We're shepherds. You got it? We are shepherds and our family always raises sheep. Now, if you tell him this, then he's going to let you settle in the region of Goshen. Now, this crazy. The king already said they could have Goshen. So here you have Joseph trying to devise a plan with his brothers to try to get the king to give them something that the king already promised. See, Joseph knew that the Egyptians didn't like being around anyone that, that raised sheep. So his logic was, well, Goshen is where I'm at and there's nobody out there with me. So if we tell the king that my family raised the sheep, then no, he's going to make sure that they're around. They're not around any other Egyptians. So he's going to put them in Goshen. And, 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 and Goshen was actually the best land, especially for, the, for animals and stuff. The problem with this logic is that the king already promised that he was going to give them Goshen. And not only that, Joseph already said out of his own lips, you guys are going to live with me in Goshen. So obviously Joseph really didn't believe what he said. And he didn't even believe what the king said. Uh, remember, Joseph, back in Gen uh, Gen Genesis 45 and verse 10, Joseph said to his brothers, 
you will live near me in Goshen. And now here he is trying to concoct a plan to try to get the king to agree to something that the king already said. The king already said in Genesis 45 verses 17 and 18, the king said, I will give them the best land in Egypt and they can eat whatever they want and enjoy whatever grows on it. Don't even bring animals and all that stuff. You don't need nothing. I got you. So after speaking the language of faith, Joseph, now he's actually speaking language of fear and doubt and unbelief. The king had given them a direct promise and now they're trying to come up with a plan to try to get the king to do what he said. In other words, he was wavering. And this is bad because wavering leads to faith failures. Put in the chat, say, my faith will not fail. You got to live by faith. You got to be strong in faith. Say, I'm strong in faith. So Joseph says, okay, guys, he takes five of his brothers and they go to the king. And he goes to the king and says, my brothers and my father, they're back. They have arrived from Canaan. And they brought their sheep and their goats and their cattle and everything else they, they own. And oh, by the way, they've already kind of prepositioned themselves in the, in the land of Goshen. So he's, he's like, hey, he's hedging his bets. Like, Mr. King, they, my, my, my family's here and they're already in Goshen. Like, please don't make a move. The king, <laughs> the king says, hey, guys, what do you guys do for a living? And they said, sir, we're shepherds. And our family have always raised sheep. But in our country, all the pastures dried up, obviously. And so we have no grass. And so here, we are here. We're your servants. And we're here to serve. Please let us live in the land of Goshen. Please, Mr. King, let us live in the land of Goshen. So now the brothers are pleading for something the king already said. That's terrible. Because that's showing to the king that they didn't believe what he promised. But thankfully, the king was kingly. He didn't get upset. He didn't get offended. (laughs) He said, okay, listen, whatever. He says, it's good that your father's here. It's good that everybody's arrived. I'm going to let them live. You can live wherever you want, right? But I suggest that you live in Goshen. He was acting like a king. He was like, I I have all the land. Everything belongs to me anyway. This is what you got to get this revelation. God is a king. He's like, fine. You can live wherever you want. I suggest that you live in Goshen, and then you can do whatever you want with your sheep and your goats and all that stuff out there, right? And so that's it. That's what I'm going to deal with today. So what does this mean for you today? There's a lot to unpack here, and I'm going to try to get through like eight quick nuggets and get this down in your heart. You ready? Now that I'm about to teach, I need you to open up your heart to receive. You ready? Here we go. Number one, our God likens himself to a king. Our God likens himself to a king, like the king in the text, which was Pharaoh. Our king, Jehovah, has made us many great and precious promises. Now, God tells us in his word and by his spirit what we can have. God gives us great and precious promises. And all God's promises are yes and amen. So our job is to believe what God has declared. God has already put a yes on it. We got to put an amen on it. Our job is to believe and receive what God has already decreed and declared over our lives. So when we have confidence in what God has said, in us, on us, with us, for us, by us, all of that, it's called faith. But it is not faith when you're trying to convince God to give you what he already promised. I believe God is offended when we don't take him at his word. As a father, I'm just going to be natural for a minute. As a natural father, if I promise my children something and then they come back and they're trying to plead with me, or trick me, or connive me, or coax me into giving them what I already promised, it would be clear to me that they never believed me in the first place, right? It would be clear to me that they actually, I guess, didn't believe what I said. Don't do that to God, right? So how does this apply to you, this first point? You got to believe in God's promises, and you got to live confidently. Put in the chat, say, I live confidently. Why? Because I live by faith. God is going to do everything that he said for me, for you. I got I to gotta live with the confidence that God will do what he said he would do in my life. I got to trust that what God has decreed and declared over my life has already been provided. I'm not going to be pleading to God, please, God, please give me this. Please, God, give me that. If God already said it, then if I come pleading, then God is like, well, obviously you didn't believe me in the first place. You got to strengthen your faith to take God at his word. Put in the chat, I take God at his word. And I got to un- avoid unnecessary schemes, 
of basically that are based in fear and doubt and unbelief. You don't have to attempt to convince God to give you what he already promised to give you. Faith actually is the opposite. Faith is what happens when God convinces you. I'm going to explain. You got that? So stop pleading and begging to God to give you something he already said that is yours. If it's yours, he wants you to stand in faith without a doubt, without wavering, that is already done. You got it? And you know, these people that are talking about, well, you just never know what God will do. Well, then obviously you, you, you don't believe God. You don't stand on the word. If God has given you a promise and God spoke to you specifically and directly through his word or through the Holy Spirit, then yes, you know what God is going to do and you have to stand on it. If you, if, and if you don't believe, okay, let me just use this natural example. Then I'll keep going. Let's say that I tell one of my sons, hey, go cut the grass and I'm going to give you $50. And my son is out there cutting the grass. And then I see when his friends walk by. And his friend says, hey, man, what are you doing? I'm cutting the grass. Is your dad going to pay you? Uh, well, with my dad, you just never know what my dad might do. How would that make me feel? That would make me feel terrible because obviously he doesn't believe what I said. Like my word has, has no weight with him. But if, if he's cutting the grass and I said, I'm going to give you $50, and then somebody says, hey, is your dad going to, oh yeah, he's about to give me $50, man. Matter of fact, I, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to do with the $50. Why? Because it's already done. Because if I said it, it's already done. You see what I'm saying? That's how God wants us to take him at his word. Number two, you don't have to convince God to give you what he promised. Your job is not to convince God. Your job is to believe. Faith is about believing what God has declared that is already true and, it's all, and it will come to pass in the fullness of God's timing. When God promises you something, God means it. God says what he means and he means what he says. So there's no need to strive and to struggle and to strain and to try to convince God. If God... Now, if you're trying to convince God, obviously you don't believe that he said it. If God said it and he promised it, then all you do is align your life with it and believe that it's going to come to pass in the fullness of God's timing. You got to focus on believing and aligning your actions with God's promises instead of trying to convince him. Why? Because he already said it. You got to rest assured that God's promises are reliable. And everything God said shall come to pass. Put in the chat said, God is reliable. You got to develop a deep trust that if God said it, it's already done. And so I'm, com I'm coming up against fear and doubt and unbelief. If God already promised it, it's already done. And I got to rest in God's provision. I enter into God's rest concerning it. Say amen to that. Number three, faith is not about you convincing God. See, many Christians think that faith is about me trying to get God to put a yes on my plans. No, no. Faith is about God trying to get you to put a yes on his plans. Faith is not what happens when you convince God. Faith is what happens when God convinces you. And so faith is about you being fully persuaded. Put in the chat, say, oh, I'm fully persuaded. Faith is about you being so fully persuaded of what God said that you're not going to be moved by what you see with these natural eyes because you are fully persuaded. Joseph's family, they were not fully persuaded. They thought that they had a need to convince Pharaoh to give them the land that he already promised to give them. And so, so instead of just believing and receiving it, instead of just showing up and saying, hey, we're in Goshen, like you said, thanks a lot. Look, you know, good looking out. <laughs> no, they were trying to convince him to put a yes on something that he already put a yes on. And so you got to stop doing that with God. Allow God to reveal to you what he already planned to give you from the foundations of the world, what he's called you to do. And then you got to accept it with unwavering faith. Put in the chat, say, I have unwavering faith. You got to base your faith on what God said and, and not any effort to convince God. You are not here to convince God. God should convince you. You got to cultivate a heart that believes God and takes God at his word. Say, I take God at his word. Say amen to that. Number four, divine revelation is the authorization for your faith. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Remember in John chapter 5 and verse 19 and John chapter 5 and verse 30, Jesus said, I only say those things I hear my father say. I only do those things I see my father do. In other words, the, the father shows me what he wants to do, and then he invites me to get involved. The revelation becomes the authorization for my faith. So God is showing me what he's doing in the earth. God is showing me what he wants to do in my life. And now I can release faith where God has already released grace. Where there's no grace, there can be no faith. Faith begins where the will of God is known. So faith is not about me trying to get God to decide to give me what I want. No, faith is about me discovering what God already decided. 
You see what I'm saying? So this revelation becomes the authorization for my faith. God, I'm asking God to show me what he already decided for my life from the foundations of the world. What did you call me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you, like what, my life is all about you. And so, so I may not have, when God reveals it to me, I may not have any sense realm evidence to support it because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that I cannot see. And, and watch this. This is when you know you're in faith. When you, when you believe what God said, even though you don't have any sense realm evidence to support it, and you believe what God said, even though you have sense realm evidence against it. So you might have a doctor's report or financial statement saying something against what God said, and I'm so convinced of what God said that I'm not moved by that thing. I'm going to, I have a report from this world and a report from God. And whose report am I going to believe? Put in the chat, we shall believe the report of the Lord. So faith is not about me persuading God. Faith is what happens when God persuades me. Faith is about me discovering what God planned to do in, with, and through my life from the foundations of the world. And then now I believe that my life is already mapped out. And so now what am I going to do? I'm going to walk out what God has called me to do, believing that every promise Every blessing will manifest at just the right time. That I'm living a life that was preordained and pre-established by God. That I'm resting in every promise that God has decreed and declared over my life. That I believe what God believes about me. I can go where God leads me to go. I can do what God has called me to do. I am who God says I am. My life is all about him. My life is not about selfish desires. I'm not coming up with selfish things and just asking God to give it to me. I just want to please God. And along the way, God's says to me, hey, son, hey, daughter, this is what I want to do for you. And so, yes, I want you to have this. I want you to have that. Why? Because I planned it and I want to bless you because I'm a good father. And so now I get to experience God's best, but it's not about me. It's all about him. I seek God's will. I put his will above my own. My life is all about him. So when you seek God's will and you stand in faith without a doubt, without wavering, and you pray back to God the prayers that he's already prayed over you, come on. This is the confidence. John 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, John said this, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we pray anything in accordance with his will, watch this, if I'm praying back to God, something he already prayed over me, God is telling me what to ask for. God is telling me what to pray. God is telling me what he already planned to do in my life. And when I pray back to God, the prayers that he already prayed over me, watch this, this is the confidence that I have in him. He hears me and I already have it. He hears me and it's already done. He hears me and it's only a matter of time before it manifests in my life. This is the life of faith. This is a faith refresher today. You need to be reminded from time to time how to walk and live by faith. Say amen to that. Glory to God. Number five, God is literally incapable of lying. If God said it, he'll perform it. If he declared it, he'll make it good. The nature of God is truth. He cannot lie. And so every word that God speaks is a commitment from God. And he's not like us. He's not a man. He's not like humans. We say something and then we change our mind. We ch that was like, well, let's try to get Pharaoh to, because what if he changes his mind? He said we could have Goshen, but let's try to make sure he gives us Goshen, because what if he changes his mind? Stop doing that with God. God is not like that. Listen, if God said it, he declared it. If, if he promised it, he'll make it good. You got to build up your faith on the assurance that God is true and he is unchanging and he is un immutable. It, it, let the, the reality of God's immutable nature give you confidence. I have confidence because God will not change his mind. Put in the chat, God will not change his mind concerning me. Number six, you can trust that God is not going to change his mind. This is uh, Numbers 23 and 19. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man, that he should repent. If God said it, he'll perform it. If he declared it, he'll make it good. Here they are trying to convince the king to give them something he already said. Why? Because they didn't believe him, right? They thought he was going to change his mind. God's promises are immutable. God's promises are irrevocable. God is dependable. God is not going to change his mind. So you got to avoid every temptation to question what God said. Stop, stop questioning. Stop doubting what God said. You got to remember what God said. You got to believe that God is trustworthy and you got to enter into God's rest concerning it. Number seven, if you discover something that God wants to do in your life and it is clear that God wants to do it in you, with you, through you, for you, by you, then the only thing you don't know is when it's going to happen, right? So you know what is going to happen because God told you what? You don't know when it's going to happen because God didn't tell you when. So that's why you got to add patience to your faith. So it is through faith and patience that you obtain the promises of God. 
So you may not, you may struggle with when it's going to happen because God didn't tell you when, but you shouldn't struggle with what is going to happen. Do never allow thoughts of fear or doubt or unbelief to get in your heart. Never allow thoughts like, is it going to happen? Yes, it's going to happen. If God said it, now you don't know when it's going to happen if God didn't tell you when, but if God promised you something, number eight, last point, if God promised you something, then as far as God is concerned, it's already done. Put in the chat, say, it is all Ready, done. As far as God is concerned, it's already done. As far as God is concerned, then it's already been secured. Why? Because God already said it. God promised it. It's already done. Your faith has to tap into God's grace and you got to enter into God's rest. You got to believe that everything God spoke over your life in eternity is already done. And it's only a matter of time before it manifests in this world. So you got to shift your prayers from pleading to thanking. Say, put this in the chat. I shift my prayers from pleading to thanking. I'm like, no, Lord, I thank you for speaking this over. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even be praying for it if you didn't tell me that it was already mine. But now that now that I know that you want me to do this, now that I know that you wanted me to start this business, now that I know that you wanted me to go to this college, now that I know that you wanted me to enter into this marriage, now that I know that you wanted me to have this child, now that I know that you, all of these things. Now, I believe what you have declared over it I'm going to enter into your rest and I'm not going to allow fear, doubt, or unbelief to mess up anything in my heart. I stand in faith without a doubt, without wavering. Say amen to that. Glory to God. This was a great faith refresher. Let's close this message out with a declaration of faith. Lift up your voice and say this. Say, Father, I trust in your eternal plans and I rest in the assurance that they are already established in heaven. It's only a matter of time before I see them on the earth. I believe your promises are irrevocable. I acknowledge, Father, that you are incapable of lying. So if you said it, it's only a matter of time. I add patience to my faith. And I'm confident that everything will happen in my life at just the right time. So I reject fear, doubt, and unbelief. And I align my faith with what you have already promised. It's settled in heaven. And I declare that it's also settled in my heart. You will always make your word good. Your word will never return back to you void. This is why I can boldly declare, greater is coming for me. I declare this by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. This is today's word. Oh my God, that was good. Please apply it and prosper. If you're not getting these messages, please go to todaysword.org and uh, click on the big red subscribe button on the top right of the website. Put in your email address. You're going to get all my notes in your email inbox every day for free. This was a faith refresher and I said a lot and I actually talked fast. I was trying to get through a lot today. So this is a message you might want to listen to again because I kind of rushed through that. Uh, But... I poured a quart into a pint. There was a lot going on in today's message. Get this down in your heart. Listen to it again. Share it. Do three things. Number one, leave me some comments in the chat if if this message was a blessing to you. Number two, share the message on your social media, on your timeline, and with your friends. Number three, listen to this outro video. This will be a blessing to you. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. If our ministry is a blessing to you, please consider becoming a partner with Rick and Isabella Pena Ministries. Not only will you support the Word of God going out on a daily basis, but you will also support our school in the Dominican Republic, where we are providing 200 Haitian children a Christ-based education free of charge and also a hot meal every day. If you want to become a partner with us, go to ripministries.org and you'll be able to do so there. If you don't have any of my materials, well, let me just show you a few things. Well, this is my first book, Level Up Your Life, where I cover how to level up your life in five areas of your life. Here's Grace-Based Success. It's a daily devotional where in 28 days, you'll be able to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's two affirmations books, one for men and one for women. These books will help you to align your faith, your heart, and your lips with the Word of God. Or just go to rickpina.co. You'll see all the books there, apparel. Please make yourself available to those materials. They will be a blessing to you. Lastly, Isabella and I have been committed to coaching and mentorship for many, many years. And the Lord led me to use a platform where I could do it online, where we could leverage ourselves and scale. 
So now we have over 600 videos and continuing to grow. We're recording videos on a weekly basis where we're covering how to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and how to be successful as a Christian and in business and with relationships and etc. So if you're interested in that, please go to patreon.com forward slash Rick Pina. You will be blessed. Thank you for being a blessing to us. And we pray that we will continue to be a blessing to you.